All right, continuing with our series, Acts, the book of Acts, verse by verse, we are in chapter 15 with Paul's second missionary journey. And I want you to just think about this as we go through the rest of this book. We'll see how far we get today. But keep in mind who Paul is sharing his faith with. Keep in mind. You have to understand the background. Paul is a Pharisee. He's from the tribe of Benjamin, so he's an Israelite. There are several religious branches, if you will. There's the Sadducees, there's the Pharisees, and a bunch of others. But they are Israelites. So Peter got sent out first to witness to the Gentiles, probably some of the missing tribes, the lost tribes of Israel. And then, because he was also helping out with the church around Jerusalem with the other apostles, they couldn't take off to Asia Minor all the time. It's very difficult when you have thousands of Jews accepting Jesus as their Messiah. He got work to do, feeding the poor, healing the sick, all kinds of stuff. So they were tied up. Then when Barnabas came onto the scene and sold his land, he's a Levite, he sold his land, and he basically realized that Greek-speaking Jews and Greek-speaking uh, Israelites, that's probably a better way to put it, um, were converting. And perhaps Paul wasn't, or Barnabas wasn't as good with talking to the Greeks as he was with the Jews. So then he recruited Paul, because Paul had been sent away to Tarshish for a little bit of a break. Barnabas sought him out and brought him back and brought him to the apostles. And they commissioned Paul and Barnabas to go reach out to basically the Greek-speaking Israelites. That's so important. Because we see that there are synagogues coming up all through Asia Minor. So there were Jews in those synagogues and there were also Greeks. Because the majority of the people spoke Greek. The majority of the people spoke Latin. And then very few people spoke Hebrew. It's so important to know. So important to know. So when we're talking about Gentiles here, we're talking about the lost tribes of Israel. We're talking about the people that actually got divorced by God because of how they fell away. Judah, a small, tiny percentage came back from their captivity, whereas the majority of the 10 tribes of Israel, the 10 northern tribes, got dispersed into Asia Minor all the way as far as uh, England all that kind of stuff. They're dispersing that way, and they're also dispersing towards Russia. So that's important to understand that Ukraine had a heavily, heavily was heavily influenced by a lot of uh, the lost tribes of Israel. Same thing with Europe. They're mixed in all over the place. Denmark, Sweden, etc. That'll be a different video. But I need you to get that concept that Paul is spending most of his time with Jews and Greeks. And in the book of Romans, he talks about that. He said, there's neither Greek, there's neither Jew nor Greek. They're male nor female. They're all the same. So that tells you that that was the majority of his audience. All right. So let's, let's begin. Verse 36. Some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city, because this is the style. This is how Paul liked to do things. He liked to go and visit the people that he uh, had an influence over and basically led them to Jesus Christ by sharing the scriptures with them. And he said, let's go back now over the places that we preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. And Barnabas said, this is a great idea, but let's bring Mark. And Paul said, nope, I don't want that guy because he's a deserter. But Paul thought not good to take him because, remember, 
few chapters earlier, he deserted them, went back to Jerusalem. Paul did not like that. He did not like being deserted. So Paul thought it not good to take him with him who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder from one another. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. So thank God for Barnabas. Took him back home to Cyprus, his hometown. And uh, yeah, and Paul had a bit of a double copied in. I copy and paste all this stuff into a PDF format. So sometimes it takes me forever doing that. It's the only way I can actually write over top of this stuff. Anyways, but Paul thought it not good. So they, uh, let's see. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Sicilia, confirming the churches. So that was what Paul did. He wanted to establish and make sure the churches are running smooth. Now we get to Acts chapter 16. Look at this. Timothy joins Paul and Silas. So exciting. Then he came, then came he to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus. 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 The son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, Jewess, she was a Jew, and believed. So she was a believer in the Messiah. But his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. So everybody knew this guy. And probably everybody knew Timothy's mother. So Timothy was brought up under a Jewish mother and a Greek father that was a believer. Guaranteed. It's important to know that. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek, uncircumcised. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and of and the elders which were at Jerusalem. So now they had some Jews that were still of the belief that you needed to be circumcised in order to believe in the Messiah. Paul has a letter from the church at Jerusalem that says that, look, you guys don't need to keep the circumcision. You don't need to. And these are Jews saying this. This is not pagans. Jews are saying you don't need to circumcise the people that are outside of Judah. They have no idea about all the rules and re regulations and all this kind of stuff. So don't, don't put them under that burden that we ourselves couldn't even keep. So this is the letter that Paul has with him and Silas and Timothy. And they're going around saying, basically, uh, don't eat meat that's strangled and don't uh, eat the blood as well. And don't have, don't practice fornication because this is what other nations were doing at this time. And you're, you're basically incorporating all this stuff into your practices. So the church was saying, don't do this stuff. They're not saying don't follow the 10 commandments. People get that all mixed up. You'll see in the book of Acts that Luke is writing when they're journeying, they were a Sabbath journey. That is something that a Jew would know. That is something that people that practice keeping the commandments that uh, they would know about a Sabbath journey because you can't go too far. Otherwise, it's almost like work and you're breaking the Sabbath. So they were very careful to do that still. So they're telling these people, these lost tribes of Israel that were Greeks, saying, look, you don't have to do all this stuff. You can worship God exactly where you are. You don't need to go to the temple. You don't need to do all this ritual stuff. Christ has forgiven you of your sins. The Messiah has come and forgiven you. All you have to do is just believe in him. So this is part of the letter that they, they gave to all the, the churches. So anyway, continuing on. 
So as they went through the cities, they delivered the decrees to keep that they were ordained of the apostles and elders, which were at Jerusalem. Basically what I just said. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. So we're getting thousands, thousands of Jews, thousands of Greeks, accepting that Jesus is the Messiah. That's what Christian means, little anointed ones. Messiah followers. They followed Jesus of Nazareth, which was the Messiah, to not only the Jews, but all of Israel. So important, so important. People miss this for some reason. Paul's vision of the Macedonian. And now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden. So this is now basically Asia Minor. They were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, which would be to the east a bit, after they were come to Mysia. They essayed to go into Bithynia, Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. So at this time, they weren't allowed to go into all of Asia Minor. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over to Macedonia. So Paul had a vision. And help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we... Notice this now. Luke has been writing this all along. He wrote the Gospel of Luke. He also wrote the book of Acts. There are some rabbis today, like Rabbi Tovia Singer, that would say... Matthew was not written by Matthew because he's not writing it in uh, first person. Like he's not saying, I, Matthew, wrote this book. I, I, Matthew, saw Jesus. I, Matthew, blah, 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 blah. And I'm saying that is weak. It's weak. It's a weak argument. Because when you look at Genesis, Moses doesn't say, I, Moses, went up to Mount Sinai. Then I, Moses, went this way, and I talked to Pharaoh. I, Moses, said to God this. doesn't write that way at all. He doesn't. He writes in, I think it's called third person. Moses and Aaron went here. Moses did this. Moses said that. Moses said... So the idea that Matthew is writing the same way, and they're saying that Book of Matthew wasn't written by Matthew because he's not person personifying it is ridiculous. We see here Luke changing because this gives us a hint. This is what I think anyway that that now this is eyewitness stuff because now Luke is with Paul, whereas before Acts chapter sixteen, he probably had all this stuff written out asking Mark questions about Jesus Christ, asking Paul questions about what he saw, where they were, all this kind of stuff, who these people were. He's writing this all down. But now this is basically firsthand accounts from Luke's perspective. How do we know this? Well, right here. Immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia. So it changes now. Now Luke is saying we. So that tells me that he's with Paul now. To go to Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel to them. Lydia converted at Philippi. Right, so now, therefore, loosing from Troas, they're in a ship, we came with straight course to Samothracia and the next day to Neapolis and from thence to Philippi. Don't you love all the names here? This gives you an accurate description of how far they're sailing, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia. So this is an important city, Philippi. This is where we get the book of Philippians and a colony, lost tribe of Israel, right here, and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. We just don't know which tribe they're from. It's okay. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of, see, Look at this. Why would Luke put this unless they're following the Sabbath? On the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside. So they didn't go very far. Where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women, which resorted thither. And a certain woman 
woman named Lydia, seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, 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 which worship God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized, her household, this is probably one of the only families that Paul baptized with water, and her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. So Luke also went there. So Paul and Silas in prison. And it came to pass as we went to prayer. Just going to grab a drink for a second here. One gets a little bit parched when you're reading. Anyways, we are continuing on. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same Paul, the same followed, so this lady followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, clearly possessed would shew unto us the way of salvation. And this she did many days. But Paul, being grieved, so I often wonder why he was grieved. Here's my thoughts. I think he was grieved because he knew that as soon as he does something about this, as in tells her to stop or whatever, basically his ministry is going to come to a halt because now he's distracted by all the riots and all kinds of crazy stuff. So I think it just got to a point where he's like, I got to deal with this. This this lady is bugging me day after day after day, and the spirit's in her saying, uh, this is Jesus Christ and all this kind of stuff. Basically, what did she say here? This is... This is uh, sir, these are the servants of the Most High God, which she would shew us onto the way of salvation. You don't want that in the background, everywhere you go. So basically, Paul turned and said to the Spirit, not to her, but to the Spirit, I command thee, in the name of Jesus Christ, to come out of her. And she came out the same hour, and he came out, which is interesting. This is speaking, just looking at the woman. He's saying. I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. So, demons of male, I guess. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they called Paul and Silas and drew them into a marketplace onto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. So they're pulling the Roman card out, saying we're Romans. We don't follow these customs. These are strange customs that Paul is talking about, talking about Jesus Christ. This is a strange thing, a Messiah. He's talking about the salvation of Israel. These are strange customs. And we are Romans. These guys are Jews. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who? Having received such a charge thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in stocks, very similar to what happened to Joseph. Joseph, I don't think he was crippled by the, the stocks, but he was in there for a long time and it hurt. It hurt Joseph a lot. And you can see that. And I forget where that, I think it's in the book of Psalms where either King David or someone else talks about the, the, the fetters, actually hurt Joseph's feet and he was in much pain when he was in prison. So now these guys are put in the inner prison. They're not getting out. 
and their feet are actually fastened. Used to be before earlier chapters. Remember when Peter was chained to two guards and the chains let loose and then they ended up killing the guards afterwards. And then Herod died after that. Well, this time we have, I think it's Paul and Silas. Um, their feet are in stocks, which is even more difficult. If you've ever been a stock, you would know it's very difficult to break out. Obviously, I've never been in the stock, but never had my feet trapped like that. But uh, this is serious stuff. The conversion of the jailer. Okay, so at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Wow, that's very similar to when Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. There was a huge earthquake. Prison doors were open. A lot of graves were open. It's, it's kind of an interesting parallel here that Luke wrote. So that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open. So that's one way to open up the prison doors, is you just shake the whole foundation, and then the doors open. And everyone's bands were loosed. Not just Paul and Silas, but all the prisoners' bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself because it's it's a big deal. It's a corporate offense, if you will. It's capital, capital punishment. If you let all of your prisoners go in a prison, you might, you're going to get executed. So he thought it best to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled but Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in. So they were in the dark as well, which is interesting. Came trembling, sprang in and came trembling, fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Isn't that fascinating? And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes very much like Christ is going to do to us. He's going to wipe every tear. One day he's going to wipe every tear. And we're going to live in all eternity with Jesus Christ. So he washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all the straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the surgeons, saying, Let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told the saying to Paul, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. You're free to go. But Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly uncondemned being Romans and have cast us into prison. And now do they thrust us out privately? Like they're just saying, go away into the quiet. Nay, verily, no way, Jose is basically, if you want to translate it, uh, Paul is saying, no way, Jose. <laughs> and the sergeants told these words unto the magistrates. And they feared when they heard that they were Romans. Somebody's going to have some explaining to do. And they came and besought them and brought them out and desired them to depart out of the city naturally. And they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them, comforted them and departed. Hey, we're making, whoa, look at this. We're at the end of chapter 16. Awesome. Let me just stop this here. We're on a roll here. Let me just, uh, let me stop recording. Let me, let me stop sharing. Ooh, hang on here. One second. All right, we're back. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pause this video for a second and I'm going to get up my, second half of um, the PDF we're going into from basically chapter 16 to the end of Acts. So one second.
All right, you probably didn't even notice what had just happened. I just switched PDF. So now we're in chapter 17. Continuing on. This is getting good now. Paul preaches at Thessalonica. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonium, they came to Thessalonica. Thessalonica. There was a synagogue of the Jews. Look at this. Let me see here. Where's my empty? Right here. Look at this. They came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them three Sabbath days, reason with them out of the scriptures. So what scriptures would they have? They only had the Torah, the writings, and the poems. That's all they had by this time. They might have had some epistles floating around to some of the other churches. But all they had was the scriptures to share with them and say, look, Jesus of Nazareth was and is the Messiah. So I hope you get the, the understanding that Paul is spending the majority of his time with Jews and Greeks. He speaks Greek. He speaks Hebrew, writes Hebrew, writes Greek, probably speaks Latin as well. Well-versed. This is the perfect man for the job. Highly educated, a Pharisee of Pharisees. So again, as his custom was, see, it says that even right here, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Continuing on. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. They wanted to know a little bit more. And of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. So, if you were to look at the word multitude, do you think a multitude means 10 or 20 people or 100? No, probably thousands of people. And a few, the chief women, and of the chief women, not a few. So a lot of women that were very important in this area. Very important. So a lot of devout Greeks, Greeks, that understood the Torah, because this is a synagogue. Probably the majority of them now would be Greeks. The majority of, of the lost tribes of Israel were Greeks because, of again, of the diaspora. Diaspora, I think that's what it's called. Basically, they got uh, captured, simulated into society, into Asia Minor, and to the ends of the earth. So these are all basically Greek-speaking Israelites that lost some of their inheritance, if not all of their inheritance, because the Jews did not want them to come back to worship necessarily. Some of them could. But if they, uh, they probably forfeited their land, all kinds of stuff, all kinds of stuff here. So, but these were devout Greeks and... Obviously, they made it to Jerusalem to go to the temple um, because at the beginning of Acts, we see that there were Greeks from all over the place. So this is the audience that Paul and Silas are speaking to. All right, Jason sees, but the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, guys that like to cause trouble, and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and insulted the house of Jason. Basically invaded his house, sought to bring them out, of, out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason so they couldn't find Paul and Silas and some of the other guys. But they found Jason, certain brethren, unto the rulers of the city, crying that these have turned the world upside down and are come hither also, whom Jason hath received. So he received these people into his house 
And now he has to pay for it, according to them. And these all do contrary to the decrees. So these are bad guy Jews. Okay. This is not anti. This is not the gospel. The four gospels. The New Testament is not anti-Semitism. This is basically some Jews were up to no good. Believe it or not, there were some Jews that were not up to any good. All right, so whom Jace has received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar. Obviously, that's their, where their loyalty is, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. Jesus the king. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. Because the rulers of the city knew that if there is a riot, the Romans are going to come and they're going to squash us. They're going to squash us and probably fine us and we're probably going to get sent to jail. So the people of the city were a little bit nervous about this stuff going on. And when they had taken security of Jason, bribe most likely, and of other, they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Thessalonica. I gotta say that word right. In that they received the word with all the readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So what scriptures were they searching? They were searching the Old Testament. Well, Christians have the Old Testament and the New Testament. Non-Messianic Jews have just the Old Testament. They call that the Torah, the writings, the poems. But this is what all the Jews had back then. All these guys. That's all they had was the Old Testament. They can look up Daniel. They can look up Ezekiel, Isaiah, Zechariah. Moses, they can look look up the book of Moses. They can look up um, Deuteronomy, study it, and see if what Paul is saying is accurate. That's what they would do. That's why they're more normal, noble. And this is why you should be noble. You should study the scriptures. Study them. All right. Therefore, many of them believed also honorable women. So more women, which were Greeks. And of men, not a few. So lots of people. I hope you get the idea that there are a lot of Greeks, a lot of Jews being saved, a lot of women, a lot of men. And of men, not a few. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge of the word of God was preached of Paul Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. So these Jews didn't like that. So then they came to cause trouble. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to see, but Silas and Timotheus abode there still. So they got Paul out of there. They didn't want to lose Paul because they needed Paul. Uh, but Silas and Timothy stayed. So they thought it best to send Paul away to go by the sea. And then, Paul, and then Silas and Timothy were comfortable enough to calm things down. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. So after Paul got to Athens, they said, you guys should come here as well. So then they departed uh, basically as quick as they could to go meet Paul. Now, so Paul is waiting for them to get to Athens. He basically might have sent them a letter saying, you guys got to come to uh, Athens. Timothy and Silas wanted to stick around and basically establish this church, but Paul needed them in Athens. So that's why they departed. Meanwhile, Paul is at Athens first. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore, disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews. Man, we're on chapter 17, and we're still dealing with the Jews in Athens now. And with the devout persons, probably Greeks. And in the market daily with them that met with him. 
So now we get to the part where he's in the market and met daily with them in the market. And they're probably talking about the scriptures as well. So inside the synagogue and outside the synagogue. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. So I'm not sure who these guys are, a little bit. And some said, what does this babbler say? Other some he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Aeropagus, saying, May we know that this what this new doctrine thereof speakest is? So they want to know what's going on here. What is this new stuff? But thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. So they could have been some of the people from the lost tribes of Israel. Because they're like, this is strange. We want to know what this is. This is a strange thing. But Luke says, all the Athenians and strangers, oh yeah, definitely lost tribe right here. Whenever you see stranger, this is lost tribe of Israel, which were, they're spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. Interesting that they were always curious. All right. So Athenians were probably not Israelites. Strangers were most likely Israelites. Uh, then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are su too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Now, he wasn't being rude to them. He was just saying, look, like you're, you're already worshiping a god. You have dedications to an unknown god, and it's an inscription. It's not an, uh, it's not an idol. It's just an inscription. So there's an altar within the inscription to the unknown god. They probably didn't know his name. So this is where Paul says, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. So they're worshiping an unknown god. So him declare I unto you. So this unknown God that you have in the inscription, probably recognize that maybe it was in Hebrew. That'd be kind of interesting. Him I declare unto you. God, so now he goes into basically, this is how they were witnessing to the Jews and the Greeks and the lost tribes of Israel by going all the way back to Moses, going through the scriptures and saying, this is what, this is the history. This is what's happened. Let me get you up to speed. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And that ha and hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before anoint anointed appointed, before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation. So at the beginning, they were all separate, but they're all basically one, one nation under God. But at the beginning, he spread them all out all over and had set times for every nation. You're here, you're here, you're here, you're here to a certain time. And then eventually uh, all of Israel will be spread out to the four corners of the earth. And then eventually one day they're all going to come back. So I believe this is what Paul's talking about. He's hinting at this, that, hey, look, he hath made of one blood, one kind of blood, all nations of men to dwell on all face of the earth. Verse 27, and they should seek the Lord. This is what he wanted. If happily they might feel after him and search for him. I'm adding search, but if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being as certain also of your own poets have said. This is interesting. Your own poets have said, for we are all, we are also his offspring. Interesting, right? It's probably one of the Psalms. Maybe it is written in Hebrew. Who knows? For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold, silver, stone, graven by art or man's device. Interesting that 
Luke uses the word Godhead. That's kind of cool. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at. So in the past, you guys were free to do whatever you wanted. God gave a wink. But now, commandeth all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men that he hath raised him from the dead. Why is this assurance for all men? Because... Jesus Christ is the first fruits of being raised from the dead. And this is our assurance as well, that one day we too will be raised from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave to him. So certain men, probably Israelites, went, hey, wait a minute. This is our God clave unto him and believed among them which was Dinianus the Aeropagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them All right we're going to stop here so now Paul gets to Corinth so I'm going to stop take a break I'll probably make another video later but we're in chapter 18 so there's more Jews runs into Aquila and Priscilla is interesting we'll talk about that a little bit later this little teaser here after these things paul departed from athens and came to corinth and found a certain jew named aquila born in pontus lately come from italy so she just came from italy with his wife or he just came from italy so aquila he with his wife Priscilla because the Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. So there's a lot of Jews in Rome and came to Corinth. This is why God says later, Paul, don't worry about it. I have lots of people in Corinth because a lot of Jews came back from uh, being dispersed into Rome, which is quite interesting. Lot, probably lots of synagogues in Rome as well. Synagogues all over Asia Minor, all over the map. It's crazy, right? Okay, we're in chapter 18 next time. Thanks for watching. I know we covered a lot, but uh, or it doesn't seem like we covered a lot, but we went through a lot. Again, we're at chapter 18, and Paul's still dealing with Jews. And there are some people out there today that are saying like, well, Israel is done away with. And it's like, well, clearly not. Clearly not in the book of Acts. We still see Paul dealing with the Israelites, he's finding them. He's finding the lost tribes of Israel. And there's Jews mixed all over the place, and there are Greeks all over the place. Just the, Acts is just an awesome book. I'm telling you, it's an awesome book. You should read it. Anyways, thanks for watching. I'll see you in another video. Bye for now.